Well, we've, we've covered a, a, a great deal of uh, topics. Um, lesson number one was who is Satan and is he real? We talked about that. Lesson number two was where did Satan come from? We talked about his origin. Lesson three was Satan created evil. Is that what God did? Uh, lesson, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, lesson four, when did Satan fall? Lesson five, the works of Satan. Lesson six, the limitations of Satan. And he does. Sometimes people give off this impression that Satan is all powerful, that he is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, but he's not. Only God is. So Satan has limitations. Lesson number seven is why is Satan so angry? Because he understands, you know, his place, because he understands his defeat. Lesson number eight, can, can Satan be saved? No. God has already judged him and the fallen angels guilty. There's no redemption or salvation for them. Number nine, we talked about demons and evil spirits. Number ten, lesson ten, we talked about angels. Lesson eleven, we talked about Satan's use of denominationalism. Lesson 12, we talked about Satanism review, the, the, the worship of Satan, Satanism. We looked at a review of it. And then lesson 13 today, we're going to deal with Satan's future. And, and let's be assured of this, Satan does indeed have a future. Uh, who he is, based on what he has done, is going to come with eternal consequences. And those eternal consequences for him are unmistakable. We'll look at some specifics in just a moment, but it is a fact that he does indeed have a future. Now, is it the future he wants? Well, certainly not, but it's the future he deserves. This is going to sound a little odd to you, but before we talk about Satan's future, we have to talk about the second coming of Christ, and we'll begin to put all this together, but we have to understand uh, the power and the authority that took place when, uh, when Christ will return. So I, I want to give you two aspects of his second coming. The first is Christ indeed will come a second time. And the second one is judgment will come with him. It, it is unescapable. Uh, go over in your Bible, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And go down to verse 28. These are some verses that give us an understanding. And so the author of Hebrews says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. There he is on the cross. There his blood is being shed for us. Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 7. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. A specific reason of the second coming deals with salvation. Christ isn't coming to teach about what one needs to do to have a relationship with God. He's already done that. Christ isn't coming back to instruct people of how they're lost because of their sins. He's already done that. Christ is coming back for, for judgment. Christ is coming back with the understanding that he's not coming for salvation He's coming for judgment. Here's the second thing. Go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And I want to begin in verse 10. This is the events that are leading up to the day of Pentecost. This is the uh, disciples gathered. And it says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now this is the testimony of angels. This is the testimony of those who live in the presence of God. And what has been given to them is a fact that we all need to be thankful for. He's coming back. He's coming back. There's going to be power and authority 
and it's coming. And this is the second thing, and we see shades of it in Hebrews 9 and verse 28. But the second aspect is we have to understand, and this is going to relate to Satan, that judgment will come with him, and judgment will come with a cost. Go over to 2 Thessalonians. I got to tell you, brethren, this is one of the most scariest verses in the Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 6. And Paul says this. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These, now be very clear of who the these are, those who know not God and those who have rejected, have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, the second coming, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. Because our testimony among you was believed. So there's going to be a second coming in which judgment is going to take place. Here's the thing. It's inescapable. Everyone will face the judgment of Christ. It's inescapable. Whether you were saved or whether you were lost, a judgment will be made. Okay? Let me give you another one. Go over to Revelation chapter 22. Turn to the last, last chapter in your Bible. Revelation 22 and verse 12. Jesus says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. We'll be judged for the things we did, whether good or bad. But what does Jesus say? I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And let me give you one more. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciousness. In your, excuse me, consciousness. Conscious. He's coming back. He's going to return on that great day when the judgment seat of Christ will be upon all mankind. So the second coming is, is taught clearly in the New Testament. Uh, heaven proclaims it with the angelic appearance of those uh, at the ascension of Christ. And he's going to come for a specific reason, and that reason is judgment. We're working up to how this has a relationship to Christ. The second thing that we need to understand is that the second coming will bring an end to all things physical. For years, the Jehovah Witnesses have taught that uh, mankind, the saved, will live on a rejuvenated earth. And they have taught that the earth uh, will not be destroyed, that Christ will return, and the earth will be... Uh, renewed and set back to the times like it was in the Garden of, of Eden. The Bible, says the Bible says different. The The thing about that is that is the teaching among many in the Church of Christ today. Um, many people have adopted that stance of the uh, Jehovah Witnesses. The chief among them are those who are teaching the AD 70 doctrine Preterism. They teach that you'll live on a rejuvenated earth. The exact same doctrine preached by the Jehovah Witnesses. Yet it is in contrary to what the will of God says. And it has its foundation for being, uh, for us understanding it, is what will take place at the second coming of Christ. Here's the first thing. 
At the second coming, the end of all things physical is coming. Go over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. And notice what it says there in verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The earth today is being reserved for something. Right? The earth today is awaiting a future. We're talking about Satan's future. We'll talk about, about our future. Well, let's talk about the future of this planet that spins around the sun every 365 days and has a daylight time has a, a time period of 24 hours a day. What's going to happen to it? Well, Peter says it's reserved for fire. Fire destroys. Fire consumes. This is the future of the earth. It will occur at the second coming of Christ. Stay there in Second Peter, or, or stay there and go down to verse 10. In talking about the day of the Lord, the second coming, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, the second coming. Because of which the heavens will be destroyed, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which the righteousness in which righteousness dwells. There's a consuming day coming. We're not the, the elements will be destroyed. Think of the elements that consist of everything. Uh, all of the elements that we have, all of that will be consumed. It will be burned up. It will be uh, destroyed. There, there'll be absolutely nothing left of the physical when Christ returns. No um, rejuvenated earth. No, oh, how some people would say, a paradise on earth. None of that will take place. All of it will be destroyed. Now, here's the application that we can make to Satan. As such, since everything's going to be destroyed, and the elements are going to be burned up, then the ruler of this world will lose his place. The ruler of this world, you don't rule over something that doesn't exist. Um, you can take it a step further. You don't have any authority over something that exists. You have no control over something that doesn't exist. It ceases to be, and therefore your rule or your authority ceases to exist. This is what's going to happen at the second coming of Christ. And that's going to have a direct relationship result on Satan. Let me give you some Scriptures, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Turn over there, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. It says, Who minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Remember the parable of the seed? Remember the evil one snatches away that seed? That's what's happening. He's, Satan is the God of this age. And as the God of this age, he seeks not to do anything that's going to make your relationship with God stronger, but it's going to do just the opposite. It's going to destroy it. And it just reminds me of what we talked about last week, how all of these people could pledge their allegiance to one who's going to be destroyed. To one who is going to lose his place of authority. 
And they think he's, well, he's eternal, but eternal in suffering. Oh, yeah, no, he's not eternal on earth. That's right. Yes. Matthew 7, yeah. That, exactly. E exactly. You know, those who are walking the narrow way, and the narrow way I, is the difficult way, it's the hard way. The narrow way is where you have to make that those those tough decisions. It's where the rubber meets the road, right? Where we, we want to live. This sounds so, I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm going to say it. We have to live the hard way, the narrow way, because the broad way is the easy way. And it takes very little effort, brethren, to live the broad way, the way of the world. Very little effort. Yes. No. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes, it's it's misinterpretation of their doctrine. See, they don't they don't believe in hell, so they don't believe that there's a place of punishment where individuals are going to go. So their concept is God will rejuvenate the saved. They're kind of annihilationists where you just get destroyed. But the saved need a place to dwell. And so when they see things like a new heaven and a new earth, they interpret that literally. God will create a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth is a new order of things. A new way of things. Um, it doesn't mean, okay, God has to start over again and recreate everything. So, I mean, they, they take it to be that way. That he'll put back Eden on earth. The, the uh, paradise on earth but I, I think contextually if you look at the phrases of a new heaven and new earth as John uses them in the book of Revelation um, you'll quickly come to the conclusion that he's not talking about a literal new heaven and a new earth Right. Yeah. No, I can I can see that connection to those things. Oh, yes. Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the God of this age is going to lose his place. Go over to. Um, um, did I do Ephesians 2 and verse 2 yet? I don't think so. Go over to Ephesians 2. In verse 2, in which once, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This is Satan's foothold. Right? This is where Satan is doing his best work. Uh, this is where Satan seeks to cause uh, division and strife and, and, and all those things that come with his different devices. He's at work in those who are disobedient. Okay, He's at work in them. So the second coming is going to bring the end of all things physical. And if that's true, and it is, 2 Peter 3 and verse 7, verses 10 through 13, then Satan's going to lose his place. Go over to the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, and beginning in verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Where is he going to be cast out to? Well, Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew that, that he'll be cast to hell. 
that the righteous will go to heaven, the unrighteous will go to hell. The Bible says that heaven was created for the devil and his angels. That's where he's going. We're talking about his future. He ain't going to a place where he'll get his own reign, his own rule. You know, I, when we began, I talked about how society, um, how human literature and things of that nature has impacted our our concept of the devil and what the devil does, and this idea of the uh, devil having a uh, you know a pitchfork and and poking you and all those things. Um, that's, that's simply not a concept that is given to us in the pages of Scripture. You don't see it, not one single time. And so there's this thought that when Christ returns and Satan is cast out, he'll go to his own place, which is hell, where he'll rule. He'll rule in hell, you see. He'll be in charge of hell is the vision that's always given to you. I know. You know, even Michael the archangel didn't give an accusation against Satan when they were disputing over the body of Moses. Uh, he said, the Lord rebuke you. Not me. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. And so this concept of he's going to sit on this big throne in hell and rule, he's going to be in just as much pain and anguish as everybody else who's going there. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood's concept of what the ultimate... Uh, future of Satan is going to be. He won't be ruling a thing. Hollywood, not the Holy Word. <laughs> You've been listening to me. It's Hollywood, not the Holy Word. Right? And so you, you, you see that in these different places. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And then I'll give you one more. And we, we, we touched on this over in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, verse uh, 35, we, we, we've, we've touched on this. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth are going away. Not rejuvenated, not recreated. They're going away. Right? But what, won't, what will never end? While heaven and earth will end, the word of God will never end. The word of God will be eternal. Okay? So if, if the Bible is to be trusted, and I believe it is, it should be, and we see that the end of all things physical is coming, and Satan finds his rule in this physical realm, uh, certainly he's a spiritual being, but he operates in this physical realm with his devices. This is the one that uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 is that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mean, that's us. He's after us. Okay? And so if all of this is going to end and the saved are going to go to heaven and the lost are going to go to hell, then Satan will have his place with the lost. Remember, he's already been judged. He's already been judged. There's no salvation for Satan. There's no salvation for the falling angels. Their judgment has been passed upon them. So he's not left to any place I'm, I'm being hyperbole here. He doesn't get his own planet in the end. Where he's going to rule over people in anguish. He goes to a, a place. And, that, and that's what we see in the last part there. Um, we see that the second coming will be bring that judgment upon Satan. And we see first of all that a place has been prepared for him. And we talked about this. And I want to highlight some of the attributes. Um, some characteristics that are given about what his existence is going to be. What, what, strike that. What, what his future is going to consist of. Okay? He's a defeated foe. He's scrambling around trying to take as many people as he possibly can with him. But he is a defeated foe. As many as I can take with me. Absolutely right. Um, notice some of the characteristics of where Satan is going to go. Go over to Matthew 25. And we touched on some of these. Matthew chapter 25. And go down beginning in verse 41. And uh, Jesus is the one who's doing the speaking. 
Then he says, then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He's going to a place of everlasting fire. Let me tell you how, how bad hell must be. That when making a, uh, when qualifying to man what hell is going to be like, the image of fire is used. Everlasting fire. Just think of that. Think of the hottest furnace you can imagine and stepping into it. It's this everlasting uh, fire. It's, 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 it's what awaits him. It's what awaits all the ungodly. It's why we persuade man. It's why we take the gospel out there. It's why we want to reach the lost. Because we understand what the future is of those who are lost. That ought to motivate all of us to be evangelistic. I want everybody that I can have contact with to know that Christ is a, is, 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 is a bringer of salvation. And that God wants, desires us to be saved. And to go to heaven. But by man's free choice, he can choose to go to hell. Right. I, I think he intended to have his rule on earth. And for things to continue the way they are. The totality of God's plan wasn't revealed to all of the angels. In fact, it says they desired to look into these things. So... A complete understanding of what the ultimate outcome was going to be wasn't revealed to the angels. You have that revelation when Christ comes. Oh, the second coming, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't, I, I think he, um, wow, I'm thinking for the devil. Uh, I'll say based on, based on what I take away from Scripture. I think his concept was in this world, he would have possession of those uh, who did not become saved. And whatever form or shape that was going to be, he was going to continue with his devices to reign over them. But it didn't work that way. Didn't have Remember, Satan knew the pre-incarnate Christ. He knew the pre-incarnate Christ. Matthew chapter 4, the temptation of Christ is not their first meeting. Christ existed as the word with God and was God since the beginning. And so that wasn't their first. So, so there's a unveiling, if you will, of what the future is going to be. There's an unveiling to angelic beings who wanted to know. There's an unveiling to Satan. of what. Now he knows his destiny. It's not hidden from him. It's been revealed. But let me say this. It's hard to hear. Well, I'm answering for you. That's not fair. It's hard for me to hear. That man will share, those outside of Christ will share in the same future as Satan. If everlasting fire is for us and then it's for him, how do we think we're going to escape it? Notice some other uh, characteristics, characteristics. Go over to uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 and notice these words in verse 10. <laughs> the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. <coughs> uh, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So not only is his future consisting of everlasting fire, it's consisting of torment for all eternity. The Yes. I, there's no doubt to me that Satan knows the future of his destiny, which is why he's so rabid in what he does. There's, there's, 
what's been revealed to us has been revealed to Satan. And the, the future destiny, um, I, S Satan understands that it can't be changed. So I don't think Satan wonders, wow, in, in the end, do I win? In the end, do I overcome? That's a concept called dualism, um, where Satan and God have always existed. It's separate and apart from one another, and they've always been fighting with one another. I don't think he sits around wondering what's going to happen. I think it's been revealed to him and to us what's going to happen. And um, to be honest, I think it terrifies him. Because the concepts that I see regarding hell certainly terrify me. So hell is going to consist of everlasting fire. It's going to consist of torment for all eternity. Go back. Uh, you're in Revelation Turn back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And I'll give you a couple of verses here, beginning in, in um, verse 41. At the second coming, it's talking, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. We've already seen everlasting fire will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The end for the saved is wonderful. The end of the loss is a terrible, terrible thing. You think of gnashing. Oh, you, 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 uh, you cut your finger. Oh, you slam. I had a habit when I was, I don't know why. I wasn't the smartest kid, I'll be honest with you. And I had a habit of slamming my fingers in the car door because I would uh, open the door by the handle, then I would hold it by its side and I would close it. I, I, I admit that was foolish. But it would cause me to, oh, gnashing my teeth. What we do in pain. Back in the old western days when, uh, when, um, um, Tro uh, when Troy was a uh, Texas Ranger roaming around on his horse and he got a bullet wound. He had to cut it out with a knife and bite on a strap of leather. Ugh, gnashing his teeth. Okay? This, this is the concept of anguish. Anguish. That's from Dante's Inferno. That's right. Uh, which has been another book that has influenced man's understanding of hell in a wrong way. The concentric circles of hell where there's different levels of punishment for, for different things. It was, a, it was a slight against the Catholic Church is what it was. But um, yeah, that's where that comes from. Some of the roller coasters, the rides will say, abandon all hope ye who enter here as you go through that tunnel at the, the beginning. Uh, so here's another one. There will be gnashing of teeth. And then 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I think, is probably the most important aspect. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and look at verse 9. Uh, Paul says, these, you go back to 7, 8, then you come to 9. We, we looked at this in flaming fire, taking vengeance, right? We looked at this. Then these shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. From the presence of the Lord. When I was putting some of this material together, I was listening to some different comments that, that men were making. And I listened to one guy who was teaching a Bible class at one of the schools of preaching. And he said, and this was several years ago. And in talking about hell, he said, you know, how sad it is be that those who go to hell, God's not even going to care that they went to hell. I can't think of a more false statement in all of my life than something like that. Of course God is going to care. Of course it's going to grieve the heart of God. God desires, desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Doesn't that reflect the quality of his heart? 
Would he then not have any of that, that angst for those who are lost? I, I think he will care who goes to hell. I think he will. I think that is as false a statement as you can get. But there will be this separation from God. And then finally, um, knowing all of those things, those attributes of God, uh, knowing all these things, we understand that to follow Satan is to partake in his faith. To follow Satan is to partake in his... If, if, if the world, if individuals want to latch their wagon, hitch their wagon to Satan, then they get where Satan is taking them. Okay? They get to where Satan is taking them. Um, and what you begin to see is that he gets no eternal power, none... Uh, so those who are of his followers will not be following anyone of eternal power. He gets no equality with God. Think of, uh, think of uh, Ezekiel, think of Isaiah, where he wanted to rise to the heights of God, where he wanted to sit among the throne of God. He gets, he gets no equality with God. And he gets no domain to call his own. His, his future... Is hell. A horrible, terrible place that has been prepared for him. Folks, he's a loser. And it is a fundamental concept. It is a clear understanding that he will not give anything to anybody who pledges their allegiance to him by which they could call themselves a winner. I'm not saying they don't have pleasure on the earth during this time. I'm not saying that they don't get their will on earth during this time. I'm not saying that things can be good for them on this earth during this time. I'm not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but I am saying that at the second coming, all of that will end. And Satan and the lost will be consigned to a place of torment forever. Any questions or comments? Anybody? Yes, Ed. When we look at uh, Christ, um, well, the, the temptation uh, in the wilderness. Matthew 4. Where uh, Satan is, is tempting him in what he wants. Right. That's right. How, how, how is it that he thinks that it's possible to prove God, inspire, uh, all these different ideas? Right. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head. He refuses to obey the, that that's been revealed. Just like we do. I, I don't... I, 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 I'm not trying to scare you with hell, but I am trying to educate you. And it's a fundamental understanding that we know that if we reject God, that we'll go to hell. But not everybody chooses to believe that. Or accept it. And I think what Brother uh, Ed is saying is, is true of Satan as well. Anybody else? Yes. It's 
Right. Yeah, it reminds me of 2 uh, Timothy 3 and verse 16, where all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. But if you reject the word, you reject all of those aspects that the word does. Absolutely. Psalms uh, 91. All right, let's turn over there. Psalm 91, uh, beginning in verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He had tried to apply that to Christ. And he twisted it. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. You're right. Very good point. Yes. That's correct. His fate is fixed. Well, thank you all very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Brother Ed will take over next week, and we'll continue our study in the book of Acts. So I would encourage you to do this. We got through the first 12 chapters. I would encourage you to read those first 12 chapters again.